Amen. Thank you, Pastor Randy. Yes, Thank you, uh, my sweetheart. Uh, 33 years next month. Uh, amen. And, yeah, yeah y'all need to pray for her. She's been through it. <laughs> amen. <laughs> But she's still with me, amen? And uh, thank you, my son, my youngest, uh, uh, who is here with me tonight as well, and uh, those of you from Harvest who came to support. I'm excited about tonight uh, and uh, the opportunity that I have uh, to, to share. When Pastor Randy asked me to come, uh, <laughs> his message said that uh, we in America need a great awakening. I said, okay, amen. Amen. I'm, yeah, all right now, y'all. I'm going to say that again just because y'all just missed an opportunity, amen? Uh, pastor Randy, your pastor said to me and to the other pastors, we need a great awakening in America. Amen, amen. amen. And, and so to be a part of that, I, I, I began to pray and, 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 and see, God, what do I say? What do I share? How do I, how do I fit in? with what you want to communicate to your church uh, during this week because I believe that God will kind of take all of it and, yes, and, and just like if God can take, you know, all the authors of the Bible and, and make one cohesive word, then he can take four or five pastors and good old country boys from Tuscaloosa, Alabama and put together a message that can rock Tuscaloosa. Amen? Amen. 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 And, 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 and I thank God for men... Uh, like Pastor Randy, who are, are not afraid to allow people to come in and partner and walk alongside him uh, to help reach Tuscaloosa, because you know it takes a kingdom mindset uh, for that to happen. So I'm honored to be a part of that. And so I, I started off, and, and my message was going to be make room for God. Uh, and, and, and that would be a good one. I mean, we really in America, we are so busy doing and things, and we're so busy that, that we have kind of added God to our life instead of making room for him. Uh, and, and, uh, instead of sliding over in the bed, we want him to pull a chair up and sit beside us in the bed, but we don't want him to get in the bed with us. But God changed that. Amen? <laughs> that was going to be a good one. And then, of course, when God changes, you're like, oh, God, am I, am I, am I, am, did I change you the right thing? Did I miss you? And so... You, you, you go, and, and, and my message tonight is fire that can't be contained. And, 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 <laughs> and I don't know the gentleman's name behind me uh, right here. He, he, he leaned over and said, now listen, I've been praying for you. And he said, I'm going to need you to preach. <laughs> he said, now I'm going to need you to preach like fire shut up in your bones. Let me, y'all want me, let me, let me, let me read uh, my scripture for tonight. Jeremiah 28, 8 and 9 says, whenever I speak, I cry out, proclaiming violence and destruction. So the word of the Lord has brought me insult and reproach all day long. But if I say I will not mention his word or speak any more in his name, his word is in my heart like a fire a fire shut up in my bones. I am weary of holding it in. Indeed, I can not. Amen. Amen. So thank you, brother, for a confirming word uh, to know. And listen to that. That's a powerful message that, 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 that Jeremiah is saying, listen, when I speak God's word, I have to deal with people and insults, and issues, and things like that. I, I got to listen and deal with people talking about me, and saying negative things, and, 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 and reproach, and, and insults. And, and, and they don't want me to say anything else about God's Word. <laughs> but I can't help but say it even more. Amen. Why? Because the word of God in us as believers should not be able to be contained Amen. in this earthen vessel. Yes. Amen. So, so what I want to take us through tonight is talk to us about some things about fire. And 
give a few examples of what I believe we as believers can do to make sure that we're on fire. Amen? Amen. Amen. Father God, I thank you so much for tonight and for the opportunity that you have put before each of us in this day and in this season. A season when many feel like it's too hard or or, or many are walking away or backing up. Father God, let us be of that remnant that says we will press in, press forward, and move ahead. In Jesus' name, amen, amen, and amen. So I have to tie into this morning. I wasn't here this morning, but I, I pastor told me he was going to preach about the weeks and the tears and why men slept. Yes, sir. Amen. Why, 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 why we were, y'all need to understand, he was talking to the church. He wasn't talking to the world. That's right. That was to the world. While the church slept, that's what happened. Okay. And why did it happen? Because men have learned to contain God's word. Men have learned to take God's word and make it fit their agenda, to fit their group or their people or their following. See, we have got to a place where we think that the number of people who show up determine the product. You, You understand? We think that the number of people who come to something in today's culture, equals whether it's good or not. Right. Well, you understand that if Alabama plays Mississippi State Saturday, but they played Sister of the Poor, who Alabama is doesn't change based on who they're playing against and how many people show up in the stands. Right. Alabama is Alabama regardless. It's the same way with God. And as a matter of fact, sometimes you get to a place where the truth of God's word will actually cause less to come. See, God's word is a hammer, and it'll break up some rock. So if a man of God preaches the word, and there are people with a heart of stone, they're going to feel beat up or broken, or they're going to leave. Or both. It's also fire. (laughs) Now listen to what fire does. Fire draws those who seek comfort and can also be a guide to get someone lost home. If If I'm out in the midst of darkness and I can see a light, I can find my way home. And if I'm seeking comfort and it's cold outside, and I don't have a blanket, then I'm going to try to find that fire. That's what the Word can do. And you need to know that there's a lot of people out there (laughs) that are lost, that are seeking comfort. So preach the truth. Amen? Amen. Amen. But the fire will also expose those (laughs) who like darkness. Anybody know what happened when a room's been dark and there's some infestations in the room and you turn the light on, what happened? They scatter. (laughs) And when you turn and shine the light of God on an infestation in this world and people who don't want the truth, whether it's the church people or not, they will scatter. They don't want light in their darkness. And if you preach the word, you very well represent that darkness. And here's the beauty of it. I'm not talking about him. I'm not talking about your pastor preaching it up here. I'm talking about us preaching it out there. I tell my church at Harvest, the only time that I'm Pastor Martin is on Sunday morning and Wednesday night. When I walk through those doors, I'm Martin Houston, the believer in Jesus Christ, who has the exact same role and responsibility you do. And I have to preach his word and live his word there every day. 
I go to work. I'm not a full-time pastor. I'm going to work every day, and I have a choice whether I'm going to be fire and light in that world, and that's my goal for you. I believe that if we, the people of God, will, will set ourselves on fire for him, we'll see America change. We win in the end, but I'm not playing for the end. The end is secured by him and taken care of by him. I want to win today. I want to win wherever I go. I want, I want to win my family. I want to win my friends. I want to win my community. I want to win, win my, my, my job. I want to win where my grandchildren will someday be. I want to win where my, uh, my, my wife will be traveling and, and wherever my children will go. I want to win there while they are still here and I'm still here. Amen. And we can win. If we'll burn for Jesus. Now you know that fire can burn you. <laughs> if you do not handle it properly. Hebrews 12 tells us, therefore, since we are receiving a kingdom which, that, which cannot be shaken. Amen. amen. Let us have grace by which we may serve God acceptably with reverence and godly fear for our God is a consuming fire. Amen. But our God sits in heaven. Jesus sits at his right hand. Yeah. Amen. Yeah. And the Holy Spirit is in the earth. Yeah. That leaves who? You and me. He is in heaven looking down, waiting on you and I. Jesus is seated at his right hand, interceding and praying for you and I. So who in here wants to be on fire for Jesus? Amen. Let's talk about how to do that. Number one, fully surrender to Christ. Fully surrender to Christ. I shared this with uh, my church this morning. I used to live my life saying that God is first. If he can be first, that means he can be second, third, or last. He said, I never came to be first. I came to be the center of it all. Fully surrendered to him. If you want to have the fire of God burning in your life, through you, impacting wherever you go, you need to be fully surrendered to God. Anybody in here understand that, <laughs> and, 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 and I, I can say amen, I've been there. You, you get excited about God, man, you're serving God, you're loving God, but then you're growing in God, and then all of a sudden God says, I want that too. <laughs> well, oh, oh, hey, God, I mean, I've given up, and we start naming lists. <laughs> but God, isn't, isn't the fact that I don't do this and this and man, we got a whole laundry. He said, Yeah, but I want that. <laughs> oh, you mean you want it all? Uh, mm -hmm. Yeah, I want all of it. And here's what he wants he wants you to be a Christ centered uh, Christian and not a man centered Christian. See, if you're Christ centered, then everything in your life flows from it. You don't get to where we are in our American church if you're Christ-centered. Yeah. Some of you know that I host a radio show, and i never forget the first time uh, there was a gay athlete that was going to be playing, and, and everybody was talking about, uh, what are you going to say? And they were saying, what are you going to say about this? And, and, and I said, I'm going to say what I would say about anything else. And the first person that called and asked me, said, what do you think about it? I said, I don't have a thought about it. I said, but God's word says this about it, and that's what I'm going with. This is on the radio. Of course, you know, you're going to hear, and then I, but, but, but you're being judgmental. No, 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 no. I'm not being judgmental. I've given my life to Christ. I've given all authority on anything that I believe, say, act, and do to him. I can't live my life 
based on how you believe. I can't live my life based on what you've chosen to surrender to. I've chosen to surrender to the Jesus of the Bible. I've chosen to surrender to Christ and Christ alone. So if you ask me what I think about gays, I'll tell you what Jesus said or what God said. You ask me what I think about how I should spend my money, I'll tell you what God said. You ask me what I think about how I should spend my time, where I should spend my talents and my abilities, I'll tell you what God said I should do with it. Fully surrender. When, when everything, think about that bicycle spoke or, or, or anything that has a center and everything proceeds from it. Anybody ever had a bike and the spokes started to break over time instead of a smooth ride? You start hearing, doo-doo, doo-doo, doo-doo. And if you keep losing spokes, it'll become doo-doo, 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 to the point where you can't even ride it. It'll be doo-doo. And it won't even roll anymore. That's where we're getting. Every time we take something because it's 2022 Come on now. and say, well, God, that's old and that's traditional. That's old school. Every time we do that and we accept that we're taking a spoke out of the wheel. And our church will begin to limp along. Do-do. Is that what's happening in the Church of America? Absolutely. But it's not happening in the Church of America by itself. It's happening in us. You know, this is just a building. I tell my church all the time, hey, listen, if you think I taught something that's not in God's Word, come talk to me. I have one goal, and that's to preach God's Word. If the people of God <laughs> were filled with that word that consumed, then these preachers that lead other people astray wouldn't get away with it. And see, you can't say that at most churches, Pastor, because some churches don't preach the word. <laughs> I feel comfortable saying that here. Amen. Just to give you, my son, he looked at me. He said, man, you better bring it tonight. I, he looked at me when you, when you started talking and y'all started working. He said, <laughs> You better bring it. (laughs) I appreciate that he understands the spirit. Amen? Amen. But we have been crucified with Christ. It is no longer I who live, but Christ who lives in me. For you died and your life is hidden in Christ Jesus. And he died for all of us that those who live should live no longer for themselves but for him who died for them and rose again. The first step of being on fire for Jesus is to make sure that you have surrendered all of your life to him. Not part of it. Not most of it. But all of it. Y'all know that room when when those people come visit? My church has heard me say this. You know, they, they come visit and... And that door always closed. Don't know what's behind it. The guests don't, but you do. (laughs) Right? Yeah. Yeah. We have some of that in our life. The question is, will we surrender it? Will we surrender it? He wants all of you. All of you. Why does he want all of you? Number two, he wants to fill you with his spirit. (laughs) He wants to fill you with his spirit. See, if this represents your body and this container here represents your life before Christ, don't leave much room for God, does it? And so we want to get saved and we want to keep this and But every time we empty it out, it just makes more room for him to fill us with his spirit. And if we will completely empty ourselves, 
we avail ourselves to more of his power in his spirit, in his presence. Amen. The power of God. It's Luke 1 says, Jesus, partially full of the Holy Spirit. Oh, okay. oh I'm sorry. Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit <laughs> in the wilderness. And it says he returned from the wilderness, how? Full of power. All right? So read that again. Listen, it says, Jesus, full of the Holy Spirit, returned from the Jordan and was led around by the Spirit in the wilderness. And he returned full of power. Why he was out there. And anybody want to tell me what he did while he was out there? Yeah, he fasted. But what also did he do? He defeated the enemy. And how did he defeat the enemy? With the word. Huh. Interesting. The enemy came to disrupt him, to stop him, to weaken him, to pull him away, to prevent him from becoming who God called him to be. But because he had the word in him, he defeated the enemy. And he came out full of power. What would happen? I mean, I don't know how many people here. But I would say that if 120 can get on one accord and just get the Holy Spirit and just have the fire sit on them, if that 120 can shake up the whole world. New beginners, I think y'all off to a good start. I think the numbers are fine. If we all are filled with his spirit. Acts 2, 4 says, and they were all filled. Not, 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 not just them radical folks at the church. Not just the old folks at the church, not just the, 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 the mature saints. It says all 120 were filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak with other tongues as the Spirit was giving them utterance or gave them or empowered them to do so. What would happen if we had a few folks that just got hungry enough that they got in one accord and were filled with the power of God. I love the fact that it says we will be his witnesses. We won't have to tell people what God did. We won't have to say, well, I, I heard that he did this. We'll be like, this is what he did in me. This is what he did in her. This is what he's doing over there. This is what he's doing there. If you're filled with his spirit. Verse uh, Acts 4.31 says, and when they had prayed, the place where they had gathered together was shaken, and they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak the word of God with boldness. Amen. All right. Now, Peter, think about this, guys. Peter was scared of a little girl. Denied Jesus three times, cussed the little girl out at the fire. <laughs> Said, no, I don't know that man. Get out of here. Right? A few days later, filled with God's spirit, he stands up in front of the whole known world at that time for them. All of the Jewish people, all the people who had just killed his Lord and Savior and said, hey, hey, you need to repent. Spoke the word with boldness. But it wasn't just for the apostles, as people would tell you. Because it goes right here and says where they were all at. This is just the house. Of believers, it says they prayed and they were all filled again and they spoke the word with boldness. They spoke the word with boldness. Will you speak the word of God with boldness? See, if you, if you don't, you'll get asked questions and it'll make you compromise because you're not ready. What do you think about this? Well, uh, uh, no, 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 no. What do you think about this? What does God say on that? That's all you have to know. And speak it with boldness. 
And I love it if that's verse 4, I mean chapter 4, verse 13 says, And the disciples were continually filled with joy and with the Holy Spirit. And what I'm trying to show you is it's not a one-time thing. Fire is it's not enough to get set on fire for God. It's not enough to be consumed by God at the time of your salvation or your infilling. It's what do you do to continually be filled with the joy and with the Holy Spirit? What do you do to continually be re-energized? Because I can find you, I can tell you number three is you have to feed and fan the flames. You have to stoke the fire Amen. with wood. Anybody know what I'm talking about? Anybody ever been outside and, and that, hey, when you see that fire starting to go out and you cold, <laughs> you start blowing on that, trying to get that fire going back. Why? Because it brings comfort to all who, are, who can see it and experience it. Our world is growing cold. But are we, the believers, blowing the fire of God? Are we stoking the fire of God so that people who don't know any better, who don't know? Do you understand that there's whole generations of young people my son's age that were raised by people our age who walked away from God, compromised God, and now we're blaming the uh, Gen Xers? It's not their fault. It's not the Gen Xers' fault. We let the message of the world outpace the message of God and the word of God. So we have to continue to feed and fan the flames. It's not enough for it to just be burning. If... (laughs) Let me get... Four or five people, real quick. Four or five people. Just come on. Come on. Come on. All right. Praise God. Come here, brother. All right. We got a little, you know, y'all stay back now. We got a little flame right here. <laughs> we, got a little, we got a little flame right here. Just, just, just a little bitty one. Mm-hmm. Come on, bro. What, what, what? All right. You go ahead and get you a little bit. Yeah. yeah. All right. I mean, man, can you can you get a little bit? He he, he need you you hogging the fire. He need, he need to he need to back up a little bit. You get you a little bit of that. You getting my point? If we got this little bitty fire, come on. What's gonna happen? Keep coming. Keep coming. What's gonna happen if we all start getting in here? Why are we gonna make it hard for these brothers to get in? Back up. Back up. Back up, bring your wood to the fire, bring your wood to the fire, and let's all throw the fire here, and let's stand right here, and let's, uh, hey, let's just all put our woo, yeah, woo, that's good. wood yeah. on the fire, yeah. and then we can all sit back, and then people be like, what's going on over there? Because they're going to see that fire, and they're going to see us all gathered around, all stand warm and confident, and they're going to be like, I want whatever that is. Yeah. Yeah. And if we teach them to bring their wood, and then all of a sudden, what happens? Got to keep backing up. And here's the beauty of it. You know what the ingredients you can go, thank you, God. What, what, the beauty of it is this. What's the best condition? What's the best condition for a wildfire? Dry. Dry. Is America dry? <laughs> so the conditions are perfect. For revival fire. Yes. And all we need is to little spark here. Like we have our little fire here, and that group started a little fire, and that little fire. And then all we need is for a little bit of wind to do what? And all of a sudden that flame drops right over there in the middle. It doesn't seem like it's anything going on over there, but it's dry. And all of a sudden, and it connects that fire to this fire. Then it blows that way a little bit, and it changes direction, and that's over there. And the next thing you know, all of these little fires that seem to be irrelevant 
all connect and unite to one big blaze. That's up to you and I. Each one of us represents an individual fire that God has placed in the earth. And if our job, if our schools, if our communities are dry and dark, it's on us. Sinners sin. They're doing what they're supposed to do. If they don't believe Jesus, they're doing what they're supposed to do. And if we let those who say they believe Jesus compromise his word, it's still on us. Why would we give them a bigger microphone than we have? Fan the flame. Second Timothy says, for this reason, I remind you, fan into the flame the gift of God, which is in you through the laying on of hands. God said that I will give you a spirit of <laughs> love, power, and sound mind. I will not give you a spirit of fear, but a spirit of power and love and a sound mind. Fan it, fan it, fan it. But you, beloved God, building yourself up in your most holy faith by praying in the Spirit, build your fire. Fan your flame. Romans 10. So then faith comes by hearing and hearing by the Word of God. You want to fan your flame? Read God's Word. Study God's Word. Then speak God's Word. If you put God's Word in you, you will have to begin to intentionally not speak it. You will have to intentionally not share it. And if God's word isn't about to burst out of you, it's because you're not full and overflowing. Continually fan the flames. Fourth, focus on eternity. Focus on eternity. Not going to spend a lot of time on this one, but let me tell you. If you see things the way God sees them, you can't help but be on fire for him. Say that again. What do you think kept Jesus on the cross? It was you and I. He saw, if I stay on this cross, he saw what it meant for you and I. And if we begin to see, there's a song that says, give me your eyes, Lord, so I can see. If we begin to see what's at stake when we don't do, walk, act, be the light that God's called us to be. It would change everything. It would change everything if we saw it the way he sees it. We wouldn't seek for understanding. We wouldn't seek the, the, the comforts that we seek, the inconveniences that we seek. All of those things would pale in comparison to eternity and what's at stake. If you want to be a person that is set on fire by God, ask him. To give you his eyes. And then next, once you have the eyes, first, I mean, I'm going to fully surrender to Christ, be filled with his spirit, fan and continually fan the Holy Spirit that's within you and the gift that's within you. Don't lose sight that you're doing eternal business. And next, find your purpose. Find your place. You are created on purpose with a purpose. What God has put in each one of you is for somebody that needs it. I praise God for new beginnings in the DNA of this church. I praise God that there are people in this city, in this community, watching on 
uh, tell, uh, uh, on uh, social media that would not and could not walk the faith walk they walked if this man wasn't leading this church. I praise God for that. But I also praise God that he has put Harvest Church down the road and there are people who would not come to know him and serve him if it wasn't for the DNA of Harvest Church. You know what we have in common? Even though Harvest Church has, uh, has, is established under the Southern Baptist Church, and it is an all-white Southern Baptist Church for the most part. <laughs> My family do go there. <laughs> <laughs> and we do, have, we do have a lot of kids that we minister to. But for the most part, the adults are, are all white. And now I'm unashamedly a black Pentecostal pastor. And, and, and that's okay. Because I love God and I love people and I preach his word. I would say that if I asked the same question here, <laughs> he would say, Love God, I love people, and I preach his word. Amen? But guess what? We don't get to go everywhere you go. So if he and I say that here, if I come to your place of work, they should say, listen, Martin Houston may work at Alabama 1. But there's no question that he loves God, he loves people, and he preaches the word. That's what should be said about you at your school, at your place of work, or wherever you are. Because that's what's going to bring revival. That's what's going to bring fire that can't be contained. See, as long as, <laughs> as, long as it's just happening on Sunday, y'all know that, right? How many people you hold in here, Pastor? 500. So let's just say y'all go to five services. That's only 2,500 people if it's packed out. That's not going to change the whole world. That may not even change our community. But what if the 500 that's coming right now all of a sudden, every day, became lovers of God, lovers of people, and preachers of the word. Amen. Every day at work, everywhere you go, every dry spot you see, you go, this is a great opportunity for some revival fire right here. <laughs> see, God is waiting on you and I to find our purpose in our place. Not all of us are called to be pastors and preachers and teachers of the word, but all of us are called to be ministers and servants of God. Yeah. And all of us have been given the ministry of reconciliation. Yeah. Every single one of us have been given that ministry. Are you walking in it? Are you walking in it? And lastly, Fellowship with other people who are on fire. <laughs> See, <laughs> you know why I love coming to this church? My son got to experience it. I love coming here to preach. When I'm preaching, this is what I, I mean, <laughs> this is kind of crazy. But this is what I feel like when y'all, when, when I'm preaching and you guys are responding, I feel like y'all sitting out there with the old, y'all, anybody ever sit there with barbecue on fire and you <laughs> like that? I'm having to, like, pipe it down because I won't keep y'all here all night. <laughs> I've had to move on a couple of those times where we're like, ooh, I could, but no, God, I, I got to get to the rest of it. Amen? When you are around people of like mind, when you hang around with people who love God, 
who are unashamed of saying, yes, I am a Christian. Yes, I believe in God. Yes, I believe God can heal. Yes, I believe God delivers. Yes, I believe God can set you free. All of a sudden, you're walking into a room, and when you walk into the room, instead of us shutting up and them keeping talking, they'll go, "Uh uh-oh, here they come. Do people change their conversation when you walk into the room? They should. If all of us, all of us, all of us, from the front row to the back row, you don't have to be, you don't have to be a great preacher. You just got to be filled with his power, his presence, and his word. Every time somebody gets born again at Harvest Church, I tell them, pray for God to give you a passion for his power, for his presence, and for his word. If you have those three things, and you find just one or two more, two or three, he said he'll show up. And if he shows up, things change. Can't have a good funeral with Jesus around. (laughs) Dead things come alive when Jesus is in the house. Amen. And the first one that needs to be is us. Fellowship. Fellowship together. Choose to connect with brothers and sisters of Christ and of like mind who love God and love people. You don't, if you do nothing, this world will continually pour water on your fire. If you do nothing, people will continually try to lessen your voice. But if you have people that you can lock arms with and connect with, then you will continually, when you're too tired, guess what they'll do? They'll put a little wood on your fire. And when they're tired, you do likewise. But the enemy wants to separate us and divide us and keep us from connecting and being united. What would happen (laughs) if what we're doing this week just became the way we did church? See, I was talking to a leader over a group of churches the other day, and I said, listen, I'm not saying my church would agree, but I'm going to tell you what this pastor's heart would be. I'm a marketing guy, and I watch McDonald's advertise that they have the Big Mac. They don't say that they got the Big Mac in Northport. They just say if you go to McDonald's, you get a Big Mac. And most of the time, I'm going to go get the Big Mac that's close to my house. Well, if I happen to be on the other side of town, I happen to be out of town, I'm still expecting the Big Mac to be the same. What would happen if we all just said, Jesus, (laughs) Jesus, Jesus, Jesus? What if somebody showed up at my church and they saw Jesus, but they happened to be out of town somewhere and they ran into the same Jesus. And they happen to be over here and they run into the same Jesus. And no matter where they go, they run into the same Jesus. And Jesus said, if I be lifted up, I'll draw all men to myself. So if we would start marketing Jesus, (laughs) preaching Jesus, sharing Jesus, loving Jesus, what would happen to this world? They won't even know. They'd be like, what do they call it, zombie apocalypse, where where they be walking? They'd be walking in the church going, I don't know why I'm here. (laughs) And it sounds funny, but that's the truth, guys. Either he's a liar or he'll do it. Either he'll do it if we lift him up or not. And if we could lift him up together, I I I told this leader, I said, man, I'd be willing to preach on Monday if another guy was willing to be preaching on Tuesday and another guy would, we could just get a big, nice facility and one preach on Monday, one preach on Sunday, one preach on Sunday night, one preach on Wednesday night. We'll have church seven days a week. (laughs) 
Could you imagine what would happen? We make people come to us when we're ready. What if they're ready to get born again on Monday? What if they're ready to get born? Uh, I'm messing now, Pastor. I'm <laughs> But that's the way my mind thinks. That's just, I mean, I'm just, I've just loved Jesus that much, and I think he's that important to the rest of the world. Amen. Can that ever happen? Who knows? Final thoughts. I have worship worship. Final thoughts. We have one life, and we don't have the luxury of wasting it. One life, and we don't have the luxury of wasting it. People's eternal destiny depends on us and how we distribute the fire of God. Think about that for a second. People's lives are impacted by whether we contain the fire or not. Are we letting the fire of God run rampant through our lives? God has not called us to a trivial life. He's not called us to a life without purpose, but he's called us to one with divine purpose and divine destiny. If we are surrendered to Jesus, filled with his spirit, focused on feeding and fanning the flames, focused on eternity, connected with other believers, and walking in our purpose, the great awakening is awaiting. I have a quote that I say to my family. And it says, keep blocking. Greatness awaits, but it waits for no one. Revival awaits. And it's waiting on us. Not to boast about my church, but when the abortion Roe versus Wade was turned over. I stood up at the church and I said, we are in revival. God doesn't have to do anything else. That's right. God is not sitting up in heaven going, and what else can I send that will bring revival? He's going, when are we, when I said that, he said, when are you, Martin, going to walk like you're in revival? When are you going to preach like you're in revival? When are you going to expect people to be born again and saved like you're in revival. A little over a month ago, we put up a baptism. We don't even have a full baptism. We put up a baptism because we do it once a quarter. In every service since then, we've not got to take it down yet. Every service, someone has been born again, baptized, and joined the church. Every service. And I'm talking about Wednesday night. We have people who have said, I'm not, I can't be there. Will you leave it up for Wednesday? That's not us. That's him. Amen. And he wants to do that every single day through you. Amen. Not, through, not just through us. Through you. You're going to see somebody tonight and tomorrow. They need the fire of God to consume their life. But they don't know that until you show them that. And you can show them that by simply being filled with his fire. Our God is a consuming fire. Has he consumed you? And if he has consumed you, now consume those around you. Father God, I thank you so much for tonight. And I thank you for every person under the sound of my voice. Right now, Father God, I know that this is a house filled with a lot of strong believers and people who love you, but I do not ever assume that everyone who's in the house of God has surrendered their heart to you. So if you're here today, if everyone would, just go ahead and stand to your feet. If you're here today, I want you to begin to pray if you're a believer. And if you're not a believer, I want you, I mean, if you're a believer, I want you to begin to pray for those who are not. And if you're here today and you've never surrendered your heart to Christ, I want to give you an opportunity to do that. I want to give you an opportunity to say, Jesus I accept you and surrender my life to you. Today is the day of salvation. This is your opportunity to do that. And you're amongst people who will love you and care for you and, 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 and to help you grow in your walk with God. Repentance is the greatest thing in the church, and we've made it a negative. You can't come to know his great gift of salvation without repentance. 
So if you're here today and you don't know Jesus Christ as your Lord and Savior, there's no shame, no guilt, nothing you've done that's too far gone for him to reach you. 